Good morning and welcome back to everybody. The topic today is to uh, try to wrap up this discussion about Boltzmann machines. And Boltzmann machines serve as a kind of basis for these so-called generative models. And uh, the Boltzmann machines allow for a uh, easy, or we shouldn't say easy, but for a, an approach where we can train a probability distribution. And uh, the basics which you're going to see with the Boltzmann machines, that's something which then enters also the variational autoencoders and partly, uh, only partly, uh, the basic philosophy of the so-called uh, generative adversarial networks. And this is uh, going to be the last topic which we will cover uh, in this semester. Uh, we may say something about variational autoencoders, but that's something which we... Uh, may leave out here. So the uh, Boltzmann machines, in particular the restricted Boltzmann machines, these are machine. These are uh, ways to generate a probability distribution and train a probability distributions. Uh, both Boltzmann machines and, in general, the restricted Boltzmann machines, they are so-called undirected probabilistic uh, graphical models, and they contain a uh, layer of observables, and uh, normally a single layer of uh, what we call latent or hidden variables, which are then uh, mm -hmm. tools which you can think of as a way to increase the uh, uh, flexibility of, of the training. These Boltzmann machines, they although in uh, practice they have only one hidden layer, they can actually be stacked uh, upon each other. And then we normally often talk about deep Boltzmann machines. So the... Uh, Reading recommendations are basically these uh, chapters of uh, Goodfellow, which covers much more material than we will have time to. And these, uh, uh, the reason why we often introduce these generative models is that uh, it can learn to represent and sample from a probability distribution. And the core idea is actually to learn some kind of parametric model of the probability distribution from which the training data can be drawn. And uh, discriminative models, which you have encountered before, like uh, a standard neural network, uh, is that one of their drawbacks is that they require uh, labeled data, which is normally very expensive. And uh, we often have a limited set of labeled data. And uh, there are tasks which they cannot accomplish, uh, like drawing new examples from an unknown probability distribution. So Boltzmann machines uh, rely, uh, or these generative models, they rely a lot on uh, our capability to calculate uh, a given probability distribution, which has a normalization constant, which we call the partition function, and the uh, capability then to uh, use elements from Bayesian calculus. So we need something which is called the marginal probability, and we need also the conditional probability. So one of the things I wanted to do now was simply just to bring up uh, some of the basic and overarching elements which enter uh, the training of these Boltzmann machines. Uh, just to be, uh, just to say a little bit more here. So a model of images would learn to draw new examples so that you could train a probability where you can actually uh, make predictions based on this probability distribution you have trained. Uh, you can generate a sample of all the disordered easing model phase, phases and uh, where you have been given as samples of such phases. So you could train a probability distribution actually to make a prediction of whether you have an ordered or disordered phase. And uh, you could, uh, uh, in one of the applications which has been very popular, is actually to model uh, trial wave functions for Monte Carlo calculations in quantum mechanics. And they use... Uh, gradient descent based learning procedures. So there is normally no back propagation and uh, not a need for automatic differentiation for computing gradients. <laughs> Instead, you use typically Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which we have discussed in detail in uh, before the uh, Easter break. Uh, the uh, standard deep neural networks or DNNs as we often shorten to, they often have several hidden layers and uh, a general Boltzmann machine or restricted Boltzmann machine has normally one hidden layer, but you can be stacked up and then that leads normally to what's called 
deep leaf networks, but they are uh, much, much heavier to train. So let me quickly remind you of uh, some of the basics which we discussed last time. And then we are going to look at uh, how we actually can set up these probability distributions so that eventually, if you want to write your own code, you would have some of the basic elements which are needed in order to produce a final dis uh, probability distribution. And when we are done with that, uh, we will say something about the generative adversarial networks and perhaps also say something about relational autoencoders. I would also like to suggest that we uh, use next uh, uh, next Wednesday. Uh, we can use that one to try to wrap up and see where we are when it comes to the project. So we could have a more, uh, more in-depth uh, discussion of uh, the projects and what kind of things are missing before we then just use the rest of the month of May for project work only. I hope that sounds okay. So let me uh, switch back to the uh, whiteboard and uh, let's go through some of the basics. And for those of you taking physics 4411, uh, you will encounter many of the same things here because uh, Boltzmann machines is a kind of uh, uh, approach which has been used to generate the uh, trial wave functions as well. So what we are interested in when we look at these Boltzmann machines and what we normally are looking at are what we call restricted Boltzmann machines or RBMs. So we would typically have a one hidden layer. And you could think of these nodes as represented by this uh, circles here. So we would have a hidden node H1, H2, and this continues on to the last hidden node, Hm. And then we would have a set of uh, visible uh, nodes or the visible layer. So this is so normally called the visible layer. And we would have a set of nodes here, X1, X2, and this goes up to some X of N. And this normally is something which could represent the input data which we have. So the uh, uh, nodes in each uh, separate layer are not connected. Uh, a full Boltzmann machine has uh, been defined in terms of nodes which are also connected layer by layer, but this uh, increases the training, uh, uh, you know, the CPU expenditure and training and makes the training much more difficult. So what's normally the case is that you would have a connection between the uh, visible layer and the uh, hidden layer. So that leads to weights and biases, which need to be trained. And then we can just continue with the other ones. So we have X1 connected with all the other nodes here through the weights. And uh, typically what we end up with then is a set of parameters theta, which are then given by the weights. and. Uh, now I'm just writing this in terms of a matrix. And then there is a bias, B, for the uh, visible layer. And there's a bias vector for the hidden layer. So these are parameters which need to be trained. And what we normally do with a Boltzmann machine is that we uh, want to evaluate a probability distribution. So this is what we want to train. And then this probability distribution can then be used to generate new events. So we would have a, a set of a visible uh, nodes represented by this vector x. So x here represents all the visible nodes. So this would be an x1, x2, etc. Up to some x of n. And similarly, we would have h here, which is now represented by this uh, the uh, hidden nodes and uh, the hidden nodes or the and the visible nodes they can take continuous values or they can be discrete values and normally what is the case is that the visible layer can take either discrete values or continuous values and the uh, hidden layer is normally represented in terms of uh, just discrete variables and often just a binary a set of outcomes like zero and one or minus one or plus one. 
So the um, probability distribution which we have is going to be a function of uh, the uh, parameters which we want to train when we optimize the probability distribution and then the visible and the input nodes. And typically what we want then is to represent this by some probability function which can be uh, calculated in an easier way, an age of theta. And this is divided by a normalization constant, which where we borrow the name from statistical mechanics and it's called the partition function, but this is nothing but a normalization constant. And what we are interested in is what's called the marginal probability. So we are interested in, and let me define these quantities. In the so-called marginal probabilities, And you will see that this is something which we need when we're going to train the network. The marginal probabilities. So this is early in the morning for me, so that I need to wake up a little bit when I write here. So the marginal probability, so we would need a probability P of X of theta, which is then going to be given by a P tilde of just as a function of X and theta and then divided by this partition function theta here and the p tilde of x of theta is then going to be given by a sum and in case h is a uh, continuous variable you will have to replace the sum with an integ integral but in our case this is now given by the uh, sum over this probability p of p tilde of x and then h, and then theta. The uh, partition function, which we have defined here, is now given as a sum over both x and h of the probabilities, which we have defined this p tilde, x of h, of theta. And finally, the uh, probability distribution, which we have set up this specific model, which we have, is going to be defined in terms of the standard Boltzmann distribution, where we have an exponential of e to the minus beta, and beta is the inverse temperature. Normally that is a parameter which we don't use, so we typically set the beta to one, and that means that we uh, end up with an expression for a quantity which is called the energy function, where we now make a model for the relationship between the uh, visible nodes and the hidden nodes. And this depends on the parameters theta here. So what we have typically then is a uh, so-called Boltzmann distribution. And we want to optimize this uh, marginal distribution, uh, Px. We will also need another marginal distribution. And I'm coming back to that when we are setting up the final expressions in case you would like to program your own Boltzmann machine. So we also have the marginal distribution for the hidden nodes for H. So that means that we have a probability distribution. And if we now skip the partition function, which is just a constant, we would then need this uh, H as a function of theta. And this is going to be proportional to the sum over X and this will contain this probability distribution x of h of theta and this tilde term here. And then we also have the, the partition function which is needed in the denominator. So we would need that one. We will also need what's normally called the conditional probabilities. And this follows from the Bayes theorem, which we discussed a little bit earlier. We need also these conditional probabilities conditional probabilities. And you will see why uh, this uh, is the case when we now are going to look into more into the details. So we will need these quantities. So we will need a probability of X given H. So I'm just writing it in a more generic form here and where I'm skipping the uh, theta dependence. And we will also need the probability of h given x. So these are quantities which we typically need when we are going to simulate these Boltzmann machines.
And uh, these energy functions, which you have encountered here, they are often tuned so that you can uh, find analytical expressions for these different probabilities. That makes it easier to perform the sampling when you set up a Markov Monte Carlo chain. So the way you train these parameters is by a Markov Monte Carlo chain, where you typically have uh, uh, either the Gibbs sampling as a way to accept or reject a suggested move, or you have a metropolis hastings sampling. In many of these applications, pe what people often choose is Gibbs sampling, which we discussed last week. So if you go back to the uh, lecture notes from last week, you will find, uh, especially the whiteboard notes, you will find a discussion of this. Now, when we do the training, uh, we can choose now to uh, optimize the probability. So the typical maximum likelihood, this is normally what is done. However, since we have a probability function, it sometimes it's a little bit trickier to actually perform the optimization. So what is normally done in order to optimize the probability, so this follows from what's called the maximum likelihood uh, statement or theorem, and uh, we then, then end up with maximizing the probability so that we can reproduce the data which we have, maximizing P of uh, X, H, and theta is normally done by using the log of the probability by maximizing. So let me quickly repeat the uh, uh, arguments which we uh, have to deal with. So what we end up with then is an optimal parameter, which is given by the maximization. Or if you put a minus sign, you can minimize. But uh, tendentially in, in, uh, in the theory of Boltzmann machines, people tend to maximize the log of the probability distribution. So with respect to all the theta which we have, and this lives in a space of dimensionality n, and they are normally assumed to be real variables, the weights and the biases. And this is something which is now given in terms of the log of the probability distribution. So one thing we end up with then is to actually maximize the log of the marginal probability. So we have already integrated away or summed away the uh, hidden nodes. So this is the quantity which is uh, normally optimized in terms of finding, uh, in, in order to find the optimal parameters theta. So this basically means that we need to find the gradient. So this leads to us driving the gradient to zero. So we have a gradient with respect to uh, the parameters theta. And I'm gonna write this uh, without the arrows uh, because it should be uh, easy to infer from the context that this is a gradient, so I don't need to put the arrows to indicate as a vector. So this is a log P of uh, X of theta. And if we write it out, then this becomes, if we use the expression which we have for the probability distribution, the one which we defined here, this quantity here, that is, contains the ratio between the model which we have made where we have this uh, energy function, E here, and then we have to divide it by the partition function. And when you calculate the uh, uh, optimization or you perform the optimization of the uh, probability distribution, the problem, as we discussed last time, deals with the calculation of the partition function. And there are lots of tricks. So if you go into chapter 18 of the textbook by Goodfellow et al., you will find many different ways to deal with the calculation of the uh, tricky part, which is the partition function, which in principle is an infinite sum over all the variables which we have. Because we could have an infinity of hidden layers and an infinity of uh, input nodes. But in principle, the sum is finite, but still it's difficult to evaluate. It can represent some multidimensional animal, which uh, is difficult to sample from. So the uh, function which we end up having to calculate is then the, and I'm skipping the vector sign here. We have the log of uh, P tilde, where this is now the marginal probability. And then we have minus the log of the partition function, which now depends 
on this parameter theta only because we have uh, summed away the uh, visible nodes and the hidden nodes. So that depends only on the parameters theta. And the first one is called the positive phase and then the second one is called the negative phase. And it's the partition function, which is difficult to calculate. The first term also uh, may be difficult to calculate because it spans many, many variables. But normally this is seen as the tractable object. And just to quickly remind you of what we did last time so that you have everything clear here before we move on. So the log C here of theta, which you is the tricky part. Uh, we know that that one, when we take the derivative, that is simply given by the derivative of the partition function. And now I'm skipping the variable theta because C depends only on the parameters theta. Because we have summed up, if you look back at the definition here, the partition function is now given by the sum over the variables x and h. So if we do that and skip that uh, 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 theta dependence, we can actually rewrite this one in terms of a sum over x. And uh, we are now skipping the sum over h. We assume that has been performed. So we would have a del delta theta with uh, respect to this p tilde of x and theta. And this is then divided by c here. And uh, we will later, now we start skipping the theta dependence. So we can skip that one or keep it. I'm going to skip the theta dependence in, this, in the coming uh, uh, equations. So this model, which we also have defined, this p tilde of x is always larger than zero. Uh, there is a uh, very, very small probability if the uh, exponential has a very, very large argument. It's e to the minus e, the exponential to the minus e. So the probability has always a value which is different from zero. So that's something which is important to keep in mind. And uh, what we have then, if we look at this equation, this is going to be given by x. And now I'm going to skip the theta dependence and the x dependence in the partition function, or this uh, function p tilde. And is, this is something which we can rewrite as the exponential of log of a p tilde. And this is divided still with z. And this function here is something which we can rewrite as a sum over x, where x uh, is implicitly given in p tilde. And this becomes simply the exponential. And then I have log of p tilde. And this is actually a function of x. And then we have uh, the derivative of log of p tilde of x. And we are skipping this theta dependence divided by c here. And this is given by the sum over x. And then I have p tilde of x. And still skipping this dependence on uh, theta. And then we have a p tilde of x divided by z. And if we go back to the definition of the probability, the terms which you have here, this term here is nothing but the probability distribution, which we want to optimize. So this is the same as the sum over x of p of x multiplied with delta, with the gradient of this function, which we can calculate, which does not depend on the sum over all the variables x and h. This is the marginal probability. And this is nothing but the expectation value. So if you think back of an expectation value of a quantity x, that is given in terms of a discrete probability as a p of x multiplied with x. And if we have a moment, we can actually put an n on top of here. So that means that the final equation, which is normally evaluated, is actually the expectation value of uh, this quantity delta theta of log of p tilde of x. And this is one of the things which we discussed uh, uh, last time. Uh, so this is a kind of repetition of where we were last time. And last time we discussed also how you can do the sampling. We set up an algorithm for computing this quantity here. So 
Uh, in the optimization process, what you will typically have is a Markov chain Monte Carlo process. And in this Markov chain Monte Carlo process, you repeat this again and again. And then you would be training your network so that you find the optimal parameters which drive this gradient to zero. And in, so in the optimization process, what you need to do then is actually to, uh, in the Markov chain Monte Carlo, where you draw new points, what you need to do then is to calculate the gradient here and optimize the function by driving this gradient to zero. So there is no back propagation as you would have in a standard feed forward neural network. And there is no, uh, normally there is no usage of automatic differentiation. So these are the basic steps in the setup of a Boltzmann machine. So the thing which I wanted to say a little bit about now is the derivation of uh, this uh, energy function, which we defined here. So this specific, uh, let me just go back again. We have it, where did I put it? This function, which you have here, this is the one where we are going to make a model for the probability distribution. And we're going to need quantities like the conditional distribution, and we're going to need the marginal distributions. Because at the end, we want actually the probability for the visible layer only. We are not interested in the probabilities of the marginal, or no, sorry, of the, of the hidden, hidden nodes. I mean, that functions more as a kind of a, a calculational uh, tool, which we use to increase the flexibility of the model. So uh, we can now set up something which has one hidden layer, or we can set up more hidden layers so normally one splits between deep belief networks, uh, which can have directed probabilities or just a standard Boltzmann machine, which means that we are just stacking hidden layers on top of each other. And this is normally given in terms of so-called undirected probabilities. But in general, what is done is actually to train a standard uh, restricted Boltzmann machine. We have only one hidden layer. So what I wanted to do now is just to go back to the uh, Jupyter notebook and discuss the uh, calculation of uh, the uh, various probabilities which are needed in order to set up a final algorithm. So let me just bring back the, uh, the uh, slides. So the uh, a typical function then uh, is given by X, which represents the visible layer. And it is a vector of a given number of elements. And this layer typically represents both what the RBN might be given as training input and what we want it to be able to reconstruct. And this might, for example, be the pixels of an image or the spin values of the easy model or some coefficients which may represent speech. So Boltzmann machines in general, or these kind of generative models, they have been uh, widely popular. So the generative models are normally always centered around this kind of probability distribution way of approaching the problem. And this function H represents the hidden or latent layer. I normally view this as additional degrees of freedom, which allow you to bring in nonlinearities. <clears throat> so the network parameters you want to optimize then is a visible bias, a vector of the same length as the number of input nodes you have or visible nodes, as they're also called. And then you have B, which represents a hidden bias. I think I called them B and C in, uh, in my, in my, in my uh, handwritten notes, but it should actually be A and B, sorry for that. So the joint distribution then is given by this Boltzmann machine or the restricted Boltzmann machine, where you typically put this tau to one. And this is now the uh, T, T0 is normally put to one here. And this is the partition function. If you have continuous variables, if you have discrete variables, as we discussed on the slides, then you're summing over X and H. So that's the final normalization constant. And the network elements uh, are then uh, set up and trained by using Markov chain Monte Carlo, where what you're doing is that you're calculating the gradient and for every time you train it, or every iteration of the Markov Monte Carlo chain procedure, you uh, then want to drive the gradients 
as close to zero as possible. And then that means that you should have found the best possible representation of that uh, probability distribution, which hopefully represents the data. So everything is uh, delicately dependent on the way you define the energy function. So this E of X of H. And a very popular one is to assume that X and H take binary values. Then you end up with something which is called a binary binary Boltzmann machine or restricted Boltzmann machines. And this could be useful if you're looking at the system where the data you want to produce takes uh, values like zero and one or minus one and plus one. So for those of you who have simulated things like the easing model, and you would like to find a probability distribution which allows you to uh, decide whether you have a, uh, a disordered phase or an ordered phase, then a binary binary uh, restricted Boltzmann machine may be the model which you would like to train in order to find a probability distribution. So, uh, and then another one, which is also widely used, is actually the so-called uh, Gaussian binary restricted Boltzmann machine, where you then have continuous variables for the input layer. And then you have the discrete variables for the hidden layer. And typically then the hidden layer is given by values, uh, outputs values of zero and one. So when you're setting up the training, you need also to set up the probabilities for a given output from a hidden node and a given output from the uh, visible node. So uh, these RBMs are pretty useful when we model continuous data. And the, if you assume then that your data is distributed according to a Gaussian, then this is actually a very relevant way of uh, setting up the training of a probability distribution. So you can have uh, many other types of units so you can have a softmax and multinomial units. You can have Gaussian visible and hidden units. You can have binomial units and you can have many other types of units. Now, the basic thing, which is worth and important to keep in mind is the fact that the way you train the network and the way you are setting up the training depends very much on how efficiently you can actually calculate these functions. Now, the... Uh, slides which follow here, they follow essentially what we discussed right now when it comes to the training itself. That means the optimization where we are using gradient descent or we can use stochastic gradient descent. And then we are simply training this one in terms of this derivative of the energy function and plus the derivative of the partition function. And this is essentially what we put up here. So the uh, uh, this is normally... Uh, labeled the positive phase. And this one is something which is, depends totally on the model which we have set up. So if you go back to the handwritten notes, this is nothing but a rewrite of that one. So what follows first here is actually a rewriting of what we discussed. And I'm going to skip that one because this is just a, uh, uh, basically the uh, quick reminder of that. But now what I wanted to do is to go through some of the mathematical details. And you have to excuse me a little bit here because I just wanted to use the slides here. And I'm going to set up the uh, quantities which are needed in order to perform the training and to actually set up the output from the visible nodes and the hidden nodes. So the uh, function which we are going to optimize is actually a, a set of exponentials, which is normally called the energy function, this E. And the exponential representation is the Boltzmann distribution. And the typical uh, probability distribution, which we are interested in is on P of X, which now is given uh, normally as a product over all these variables C. And in our case, the Boltzmann distribution is now given in terms of uh, this specific quantity here. And that's the one which we want to calculate now. So the partition function, if you then have a, uh, uh, continuous variables is given by that. And in general, if you have uh, uh, not continuous variables, or you can also have continuous variables, you will typically have an energy function where you can have also connections between the different nodes. But in the restricted Boltzmann machine, uh, 
the two last terms actually disappear. So this means that you will also have weights among the input nodes and among the hidden nodes. But normally what happens is that we skip that and then we have simply just the weights and the biases which link the hidden layers and the visible layers. So a typical Boltzmann machine, uh, the restricted Boltzmann machine, the way we're going to train it is now going to be given just in terms of uh, some bias which acts on the uh, visible nodes. And then we have a similar bias which acts on the hidden nodes. And then finally, we have a uh, function here which now links the with the weights, the hidden nodes and the visible nodes. And the uh, quantity which we need then to set up when we now want this uh, marginal probability is now given in terms of an integral over all the variables h, the hidden nodes. And this can be replaced by a sum if we are dealing with a discrete probability distribution. In this case here, I'm just setting this up as continuous variables. But normally, the h's are given in terms of a discrete variable. So that means that the function you see here has to be replaced by a sum. So this is the uh, partition function for the reduced Boltzmann machine, given this type of energy function. And then you uh, set up the uh, probability distributions. And when you do the integrations here, you end up with a chain of equations, which looks pretty ugly. And you also need, when you now are producing the output from the hidden nodes, you need also the marginal probability for the hidden nodes, which then are represented by a sum over the variables x here. And I'm going to look now, uh, so these are just the uh, basic equations. And with that, when I have these two quantities, the uh, probability, marginal probability for x, and the marginal probability for h, I can then calculate the conditional probability. What is the probability of h given x? And that's given by the total probability divided by the probability of x, which then follows Bayes' theorem here. So uh, don't mind, don't worry about these expressions here because we're going to look at the expressions for the uh, uh, for the specific case which we are going to have. So the uh, most common choice. Uh, is to use a binary binary, especially if you're dealing with discrete outputs. And uh, in that case, the binary values could be zero and one, or in many physics application, you may actually have minus one and plus one, spin down and spin up, just to give you an example. And then uh, if you're familiar with easy model, so that means that when you then calculate these probability distributions and you set them up here, you can actually rewrite these sums in terms of a vector x multiplied with the biases h. So this is a vector times a vector. So that means that this is a uh, just a number. And then I have a vector b times h plus the vector x multiplied with the matrix w times the vector h. So this is a more compact way of writing the probability distribution. And the partition function is then simply the sum over x and h. So in the actual calculations, when you now are setting up a value which is being produced by the hidden node or the visible node, and this is what enters the Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling, when you're setting up either Gibbs sampling or a Metropolis Hastings sampling, then you need actually to have uh, these kind of marginal probability distributions. So you would need the probability distribution. So BB stands for binary, binary. So you need that quantity for X and you need a similar quantity for H and you need also the conditional probabilities. When you're setting up the either the Gibbs sampling rule or the Metropolis Hastings sampling rules, depending on which one you prefer. So the technicalities here, uh, deal then with the calculations of this, depending on what kind of Boltzmann machine or Boltzmann energy you've chosen. So BB here is the case with a binary uh, visible node and a binary hidden node. And in that case, what you need is to simply set up this uh, sum here, 
and you know that uh, this sum does not depend on uh, x, so you can put x outside. So this is just x transpose times a, just the inner product of these two vectors, where a is now your bias vector, which is a parameter you need to train. B is also a parameter you need to train. And then you similarly, you have the, the, uh, the weights here, which also need to be trained. So when you look at this symbol, uh, the star symbol, which you see here, let me just increase the fonts a little bit. So this symbol here means now that we are just restricting ourselves to the sum over the parameters j here. So what I did here was simply to plug in the actual expression. So what you end up with then, when you look at the expression you have, so you have a sum over h, and this exponential can simply be written out as a product over all the hidden nodes. So the nice thing with this binary binary or Gaussian binary is that you can actually set up analytical expressions for the uh, different probabilities. So you can then set up these different products here. So each one of them, h is here, can then be rewritten in terms of a sum over h1 multiplied with a sum over h2, et cetera, et cetera. This should actually be, the last one should be an hn. So this is a typo here. Let me just note that one. So I, I thought I had gotten rid of as many typos as possible, but I did not. So let me just take a note of that one so I can correct it. <clears throat> So it's very easy when you do copy and paste and you're setting up expressions here. So when you do that, you can then uh, uh, rewrite this uh, easily in terms of uh, a product of all these quantities and you have these single sums. And that's something you would then typically rewrite as this expression here. And then you have, remember now that you have only two values for hj. So hj can take the value either zero or one. So if you put it to zero, then you have just one, and then the, the other value is just one plugged in here, and that's e to the bj plus this uh, product of uh, the uh, input nodes times the matrix, and then multiplied with the j component here. So the j here, h of j, takes the value 0 and 1, and that's why you have 1 plus this function here. Alternatively, if you take minus 1 and plus 1 for h, then you would have to have e to the minus uh, bj and minus x transpose times w, because then h of j here is minus 1. So everything simplifies now when you have this binary binary representation. So this is a probability distribution which you need in order to find out what is the probability of x. With a given parameter uh, theta, which the theta now contains a, B and W. And then similarly, you can set up the uh, derivation of the uh, marginal probability. And if you just repeat this exercise and you let X be zero and one, uh, then you end up with an equation which is pretty similar to the probability distribution for X, except that now uh, you are multiplying uh, with the X's and x takes the value 0, 1. If you take minus 1 and plus 1, there will be an, an exponential with a negative argument here. So just keep that in mind, that here I've chosen x and h to output values of 0 and 1 only. When you're done with that, then you need the uh, conditional probability. So this is not the most exciting thing we are doing, but I just wanted to set up the equations which are needed when you perform the metropolis uh, sampling or you perform a Gibbs sampling because you need these probabilities. And uh, when you've done the training, the probability which you actually want to present to uh, your friends is actually this probability distribution here. And note as well that I have suppressed the dependence on the parameters A, B, and W because this is a function of A, B, and W. And when you calculate the gradients, what you're optimizing are the values of A, B, and W, which we uh, included in this parameter theta. Okay, so uh, after that, uh, we are going to set up the equation for the conditional probability.
And then we basically have all the elements which are needed in order to set up the calculation for a Boltzmann machine. But I see that I'm um, two minutes uh, above the hour. So I would just suggest that we take a small break and I'm going to... So although this topic is perhaps the not, not the most exciting one, when we are going through some of the algebra here and the mathematics, uh, this is... Uh, done because it gives you the basic building blocks when you're setting up a generative model because they all start with uh, some kind of probability distributions and typically the kind of probability distribution is a so-called energy-based model which again leads us to the Boltzmann uh, probability distribution and so the Boltzmann machines in many of their different variants whether you have coupling between the all the nodes or only between hidden and visible nodes, whether you've been stacking them or not, the way you do the sampling, whether you have a Gibbs sampling or Metropolis sampling, et cetera, et cetera. This just leads to a different variety of uh, such models here. So you have, a, uh, uh, as we saw before the break, we looked at this binary, binary Boltzmann machine. And uh, one of the things which we calculated then were the marginal probabilities, which we need, in order to set up Gibbs sampling or Metropolis sampling. And finally, we also want to have the probability of X with a given uh, variational parameters theta, which then are optimized through the calculations of the gradient. Now, the uh, conditional probability is also a quantity which we need. And typically, again, you, what you will see is a repeated usage of Bayes' rule which means that uh, when we are setting up many of these probability distributions, we simply need to use Bayes' rule. And uh, the binary binary distribution with X and H, where we have suppressed the dependence on the probability of the parameters theta, they just pop up again when you write out the explicit expressions. That's given in terms of uh, the uh, probability distribution divided by the uh, probability distribution here. And the thing which is nice now when you take these ratios is that the unwanted functions or the quantity we really would like to avoid having calculate, like the partition function disappears because we have ratios between probabilities. And then we simply have to evaluate these sums here. And when we do that, we can use the same trick as we did last time, where we now have put hj and xj equal to zero and one. And that gives us this final expression, which you see here, which is something which is tractable. And where this is just simply the uh, probability distribution for the Boltzmann, for the binary binary machine, which is what we defined this PB of HJ of X is the probability of getting H given an X here, where we have summed of all the Xs. So from this, we find the probability of a hidden unit being on or off so remember now that we have a unit which can have h, j equal to one. So that's the probability. So when you're setting up the training, uh, we need these explicit probabilities. So with the given values of x, uh, what is the probability of getting the binary node or the visible node, sorry, the hidden node uh, with a probability with an h, an output one, and the probability of an output zero. So these are functions then which are easy to calculate. So we can set up the same conditional probability of the visible units given the hidden ones. And again, if we now stick with values of zero and one, this simplifies to this equation. And then we have the same equation here, which now simply contains uh, the uh, biases for the uh, visible layer and plus the weights times the vector for the hidden layer. And these are quantities which we can then set up and calculate. So you see now why we said that normally when you use either binary binary or you have a Gaussian binary restricted Boltzmann machine, it's uh, less common to use automatic differentiation because you can normally set up uh, nice analytical expressions for the uh, different probabilities here. and thereby find also possible expressions for derivatives in terms of these probabilities.
So we have um, uh, the other uh, popular type of energy function, which is a Gaussian binary restricted Boltzmann machine. So that means that we allow now the uh, the uh, visible layer to be given by uh, uh, continuous variables. And you could assume now that the visible layer could now be represented by a Gaussian distribution so that you would now have something which uh, takes as an argument xi minus the, uh, the uh, uh, bias values divided by some uh, standard deviation. Normally you would put the standard deviation to one because we uh, often don't know what the value of it is. So you would typically see this term here disappearing and same here. And then uh, you end up now with having to calculate the norm two of this quantity. And then you have the uh, biases for the uh, hidden layer multiplied with the variables of the hidden layer. And all these, uh, remember now that all these are just uh, uh, explicit numbers. So this is an inner product which you have here. And this ends up also being a number. So the, or rather, this is a vector times a matrix times a vector. So you can then calculate the joint probabilities uh, for the uh, Gaussian binary distribution. And this is something which when you do the mathematics, you can rewrite as a product. And then finally, you can then set up uh, the final partition function and calculate the marginal probability density functions. So in this specific case, when you have a, a continuous uh, set of hidden variables, then you would end up with a, a sum of um, the hidden variables. And that can be rewritten as we did in the previous case in terms of uh, this product. And uh, you can do the same over the visible units so that you get the marginal probability for the hidden nodes. So in this case here, we put hj equal to zero or one. So that's why we get one plus this term here. If you choose minus one and plus one, you would have a negative exponential as an argument here. And then you would have a, uh, in this case, this would be the term which comes from hj equal to one. You can repeat this exercise, but now you have to labor a little bit more because uh, the uh, uh, visible nodes are given by a, a Gaussian function. And you can see that by e to the minus x squared minus a squared, x minus a squared divided by two sigma squared. And that means that we end up with uh, something which looks like this. And now since uh, the x's are continuous variables, we need to perform an integration from minus infinity to plus infinity. And this is something which we can rewrite in terms of this product over x1, x2, etc., up to the final visible node, and that gives us an integral of this type here, where we have the product of all the uh, visible nodes, and then we have to perform this integral because x is now a continuous variable. Now, this is an integral which we can actually perform, and after some greasy calculations, this ends up having the following expression, which you see here. So that's the uh, expression for the uh, marginal probability of finding h given x. And similarly, we can now calculate, uh, we have found the probability for x given h. So we're summing over all the, vis the hidden layers, the hidden nodes. And here we do the same over the visible nodes. And then we can also set up the uh, conditional probabilities of h given x. So this uh, leads now simply to this term here, because as you know, H can take values of uh, one or zero. And this quantity here then leads to the following expression when HJ is equal to one. And similarly, when HJ is equal to zero. So uh, I'm not going through all the pretty nitty details on, on the whiteboard, because that will take uh, way too much time. So I'm just setting up the final expressions, which you need to set up in order to run your Markov chain Monte Carlo machinery for training the parameters. And then you can set up the same conditional probability for the continuous variables X. And that takes, uh, when you've gone through here, 
that takes a very compact value, which is just given by a normal distribution, where you now have a, a normal distribution with your x's here, and this is squared. You have the biases for the hidden nodes, and then you have to perform the multiplication with the weights and multiply with the hidden nodes here. And these are all quantities which enter in the calculations of uh, the uh, output from the different nodes and also in the training. So uh, these are the basic elements which you would need if you're setting up Boltzmann machines. Now, as you see now, the you have a, a huge variety of energy functions which you can define. So if you go back a little bit and look at these energy functions which we put up here. So this would be the Gaussian binary restricted Boltzmann machines. There are tons of different types of Boltzmann machines you can set up. You have a, a Gaussian Bernoulli Boltzmann machines. Uh, you have a, a Gaussian Gaussian Boltzmann machines, etc., etc. So depending on the type of uh, uh, problem which you have and the data set which you have and the kind of probability you think which is best to represent the data, you may vary between different types of Boltzmann machines or restricted Boltzmann machines. Uh, we also have uh, uh, convolutional Boltzmann machines. Uh, we have uh, uh, a whole set of different types of uh, Boltzmann machines. And if you look up the textbook by uh, Goodfellow et al., you will see examples of many of these different types of Boltzmann machines. And for us, what is important is actually to understand that when we are setting up these different types of uh, uh, generative models, you need actually to define some kind of probability distribution, which is then used to generate data. So generative models mean simply that you're using uh, a probability distribution, which you train, and you train that typically with a Markov chain Monte Carlo process. And you would have a sampling rule like Gibbs sampling and or metropolis hastings samplings. You calculate the gradient of the probability distribution. You actually calculate the gradient of the log of the probability distributions. It's common to maximize it because you want to have the maximum likelihood. And when you uh, perform this process with a Markov Monte Carlo chain in order to find the optimal parameters, you are using a gradient descent inside the Markov chain Monte Carlo. And this gradient descent is the one which allows you to find the optimal parameters. So there is normally not a, a back propagation and automatic differentiation which is being implemented, but it's just a plain optimization of a probability distribution. And there are tons of such probability distributions. Now, these kind of uh, models, they enter into uh, uh, very popular methods like variational uh, autoencoders, and uh, the, the variational autoencoder actually play with different probability distributions. So there is an encoder and a decoder part, as we discussed previously when we looked at autoencoders. And then the uh, other type of uh, very popular Boltzmann's machines is, no, not Boltzmann machines, but the generative networks is actually the adversarial networks. Now, when you uh, look at the variational autoencoders, this is something which is often pretty straightforward to extend to a wide range of model architectures. And this is simply due to the advantage of these Boltzmann machines, which uh, normally just requires some uh, careful model design to maintain the kind of tractability. So the Boltzmann machines allow us to actually do that, to find models which are tractable and uh, can be implemented easily numerically. And uh, uh, these variational autoencoders, they actually work pretty well with a broad variety of different types of uh, operators, especially differential operators. They uh, have also been used to uh, generate sequences uh, by defining variational uh, recurrent neural networks, which is also a popular field of research. The uh, model which we are going to conclude uh, the, the lecture part with is what is normally called a general adversarial uh, network. So let me just bring that up quickly. So they describe a class of statistical models 
that are a contrast to these kind of discriminative models, which we have discussed already. And uh, informally, we say, just to repeat what we've been uh, discussing about generative models, we say that generative models can generate new data, while discriminative models, they discriminate between different kinds of data instances. So uh, a generative model, as we discussed, could generate new photos of animals that look like real animals, where a discriminative model is normally used to tell whether this is a cat or a dog. Whereas with a generative model, we can actually generate new data. And this is the advantage of using a probability distribution. And as we've seen, we need the joint probabilities, or we can have the uh, marginal probabilities, and we also need the conditional probabilities. Uh, gen discriminative models, they try to draw boundaries in data space. Well, generative models, they try to model how data is placed throughout the space. This is a, a kind of a bird's view on the different models which we have, whether we use generative ones or, or discriminative ones. And the, the generative ones are extremely popular when we are looking at unsupervised training. So the generative adversarial networks, and there's a pretty good description in the textbook by Goodfellow et al. And also the, the paper is actually a very good read. And it's a very short one. It's only six pages. And the simplest way to formulate a model is based on what we call a game theoretic approach. There's a zero sum game where we pit two neural networks against one another. So you can actually use neural networks when you have developed a code for that. And then one is called a generator G and one is a discriminator D. And the generator directly produces uh, a sample X and the discriminator attempts to distinguish between samples drawn from the training data and samples which are drawn from the generator. Uh, so I'm just reading from the slides here. It tries to tell the difference between the fake data produced by G and the actual data samples we want to do predictions on. And the discriminator outputs a probability value which so we do actually have a probability distribution which it outputs and that indicating the probability that x is a real training example rather than a fake example which the generator has so you have a generator and a discriminator so you could think of these as two networks and uh, or you could even think of this as two types of Boltzmann machines if you want to the simplest way to formulate the learning process uh, is actually a zero-sum game and we, where you define a function where you have the parameters, theta for the generator and theta for the discriminator. And that determines a kind of reward for the discriminator while the generator gets the conjugate reward, which has a minus sign here. And during learning, both of the networks maximize their own reward, fu reward function so that the generator gets better and better at tricking the discriminator while the discriminator gets better and better telling the difference between the fake and real data. And the generator and discriminator, they alternate on which one trains at one time. It is for one epoch. In other words, you keep the generator constant and train the discriminator. And then we keep the discriminator constant to train the generator. And then we just repeat this again and again. And this is a kind of back and forth dynamic, which lets these uh, general adversarial networks uh, tackle almost intractable generative problems. And then as the generator improves with training, the discriminator's performance gets worse because it cannot easily tell the difference between real and fake. And if the generator ends up succeeding perfectly, the discriminator will do no better than just random guessing, that is 50-50. And this progression in training, that normally poses a kind of convergence criteria for, uh, for the for the for the GANs, and the discriminator feedback gets less meaningful over time. And if we continue training after this point, then the generator is effectively training on junk data, which can undo the learning up to that point. So therefore, you will typically stop training when the discriminator starts outputting 50% everywhere. And at convergence, what you would have is that the optimal generator function is given by this uh, min-max uh, problem, of the function v here. And uh, the default choice for this v is typically uh, some uh, uh, function where you have defined a probability distribution d here, 
And uh, the main motivation for the design of GANs is that the learning process requires neither approximate inference, uh, which you would expect from variational autoencoders, or no approximation of the partition functions. And this is one of the big benefits of these methods here. So uh, below here, what you will see is a set of uh, uh, codes where I've taken a lot of code, which is adapted from a Google tutorial. So there is nothing which I have uh, made up myself here. And this is a model which trains on uh, the MNIST data set. Uh, it uses TensorFlow. Uh, I'm not going to go through this because this is something you can uh, take a look at. And uh, I want to uh, conclude the uh, the lecture part of the course here by just mentioning uh, about the general generative adversarial networks and how you would typically use uh, the probability distributions which you have generated from, let's say, a Boltzmann machine as possible inputs to also setting up a generative adversarial network. So this is basically going to conclude what I would like to say uh, from the theory part for this course. And then uh, I would like to suggest that next week when we meet, we spend most of the time uh, discussing the, uh, the projects. And we can do that uh, the week thereafter as well. And then simply try to wrap up by the end of May here. So I'm gonna stop recording.